Hello, this is Dennis Chang. I'm the owner of DC Music School and I'm working on a fairly ambitious violin project for, I don't know, either 2019, 20, however long it takes. And I've been consulting a lot with this fellow here in front of me, Peter Pirich, who I've known uh, for quite a long time actually for, uh, from uh, a common friend of ours, a great jazz musicologist, Andrew Homsey. So uh, Peter, can you just tell us who you are and what you do? Yeah, hi Dennis. Uh, I'm a violinist and uh, a luthier. I make instruments and also I design new instruments. I investigate a lot about the acoustics of instruments. But one of my passions and one of my work for the past 40 years has been custom fitting chin rests and shoulder rests for violinists and violists who have uh, difficulty finding something comfortable or who are simply in pain and can't play for more than 10 minutes. So uh, this is a relatively new uh, area of study and research and there's not much to go on so I basically have been self-taught for the past 40 years and I've come to uh, a stage where I can help people who are in dire need of help by giving them a specific chin rest of a very specific shape and material that's required for their particular needs whether it be a very tall neck or a very short neck uh, instruments which are modified for their uh, ability. At the same time, we look seriously at the way that they play, their techniques, to s determine whether their pains and discomforts are as a result of the way they've learned to play, or is it the equipment that they've been uh, obliged to play with that has caused them to play in a certain way, and therefore resulting in the pain and discomfort. Or a combination of the two? Absolutely. You know, it's like a chicken or egg type of business, you know. Uh, and more often than not, it is going to be a combination of the two. Uh, the pedagogy of the violin is very uh, limited, let's say, uh, specifically where injuries are concerned. This is a very new field for all musicians. And uh, the actual pedagogy of playing the violin has not always been the, uh, having the health of the musicians as a priority. Uh, not to mention, very often, the, I don't want to say ignorance, but lack of knowledge of the professors uh, concerning the health of the players and how the instrument is actually to be played physiologically with a variety of physiological sizes, humans, uh, this is all something that has never been really studied adequately and we're hoping to uh, uh, solve those problems here. That's actually fascinating because you say some professors, like you say, lack the knowledge and it seems that some professors actually send some of their students to you, not for you to replace them as a teacher, but for you to help them out in those is that correct? Absolutely. Uh, the, there are professors who recognize immediately that the setup that the students have is not adequate and that the choices available to them in the regular Luthery shops is not sufficient. And uh, so they just send them to me. And uh, I will work in, in conjunction with the teacher, asking them if there's anything specific that they have in mind. And we'll discuss it. We'll work as a team to make sure that these players uh, can get back to work and uh, in a healthy fashion. And you have had clients from all over the world, right? Professional musicians, amateurs. Everything. I, I will treat 12-year-old kids, and uh, I've had clients as old as 95 amateurs, professionals, people who work in uh, large orchestras in across the United States, people who have come uh, with after surgery or injuries and cannot play at all, and uh, their careers are on the line, and we just patch them up and get them out there again working. And so, as you guys are going to see, we have a young violinist, talented jazz violinist with us who's had some issues with pain and technique. And uh, hopefully this, the following video will show you what Peter does. And I guess we can reach you by email. I'll include the information and uh, stay tuned for my violin project. So, um, when you perform... Um, do you ever perform without a microphone? Yeah. Yeah? Like where? Like, uh, really depends wh whenever it's possible. Without a microphone? Yeah, whenever it's possible, I, I do it without a microphone. Like, where's that? Um, in, your, in, your, in, your, in your apartment? <laughs> <laughs> no, small, bar small quiet bars. Sometimes you can perform without, without a microphone. Like, uh, we play with Dennis at a club called Diazons. Okay. And we can we can play without microphones all the time. Really? Yeah. It okay. Sounds good. There's another place I play every Thursday. 
I can play without a microphone. But it's it's kind of rare to be honest. Without a microphone. Yeah. Yeah. But sometimes some private gigs and stuff. Yeah, in an apartment or something like that. Yeah. In a, in a private. Yeah. And so when you play uh, without a microphone, do you find it uh, different than with a microphone? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So what what do you find different? Hmm. Okay, there's the two things that I'm looking for here. Do you find uh, your your style, your interpretation, your musicality? Does it does it get changed? And physically, That's do you f- physically do you feel do you feel uh, comfortable or more comfortable or uncomfortable with one or the other? Well, it really depends, like what what setup I have, like what microphone setup I have. Mm-hmm. Like uh, if I have um, a piezoelectric uh, pickup, and and then there's a dozen other parameters that could change the feeling of it. Do you have another violin but for Sometimes that? it sounds so bad that, you know, it, it uh, makes you, it makes me um, not as, well, it affects my musicality when I improvise, for instance, but sometimes also it gives this really powerful sound, very flat sound where you don't have, you know, you just, you can play however you want and it's going to sound like. Right, right, right. So that's with the piezo. And do you have another cool. violin, or you just clip a piezo onto there? Uh, yeah, I just clip a piezo onto there. Okay, the little fishman on yeah. the bridge there. And sometimes I use a microphone when I can. Okay, so do you just uh, stand up to a microphone, yeah. or do you have if a clip on? If there's that, I prefer to use that. If there isn't, like for a private gig, for instance, I'm gonna bring my uh, small uh, condenser microphone. Okay, it's that, a, that, it, it, yeah, it goes under the tailpiece, like on a piece okay. of foam. Yeah, it okay. sounds good. Oh yeah, but uh, like in a guitar amp, not so much. Okay. But yeah, it's really different from when playing acoustic. Also, the noise around can really affect, even while playing acoustic, if it's silent, it's going to be a really different experience than sure. if there's noise. But uh, really acoustic and silence, it's, I think it's the best. Yeah. yeah like, so you can hear like the details of your sound and be like, oh, this was not good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so... Um, the reason I ask this is because uh, you know the people that have trouble, you know, like pains or whatever. Okay, it's it's related to the way they play, the physicality, but also the the actual demands. The instruments are pretty much standard, so we're not gonna mm-hmm. we can't do much with that. Although something can be done, but basically we're gonna deal with the standard instrument. But then the the environment that you're playing in and the context makes a big difference. For instance, if you're always playing with a microphone, you're not really worried about projecting. You know, so it's a different type of technique. Also, if you're playing with a microphone, you can do certain techniques quietly, but everybody will hear them, right? Yeah, that's. Uh, Whereas if you try and duplicate that acoustically, you can't use the same technique because nobody's going to hear it. And then when you use a more bow, let's say, you don't get the same expression. Mm-hmm. So it makes a stay. And then sometimes tensions creep in, you know? Like if you're trying to play a reception, playing fortissimo with no microphone, you're going to start to cramp up real soon. Right? Yeah, so it happens. Yeah, so in those cases, we say, well, take a microphone if you can. You know, yeah. save yourself. You know, if if they if you have a propensity to getting tense on a gig, you know, and lots of noise and nobody can hear you, don't don't go pressing. If you're gonna half an hour, you're finished, mm, right? It requires self discipline. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or you just get put that microphone on and say, I don't care what it sounds like. I can't hear myself, but neither can they. It's good. I'm out of here, right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So okay. So those that that's that's, that's the microphone uh, pickup situation. Now, so getting to uh, you personally. Um, Pains, discomfort. Pains. What's the history here? Uh, the history. Um, well, um, in CJEP, I when when I arrived in CJEP, I had um, like a very weird um, posture. Okay. Like very like I was really like this, you know, when I was playing. So my teacher tried to you know correct this, and she was like, yeah, "Hold your violin like this." And so ba- no, before, so, so, so you start, so you stood before CJEP. Who did, who did you study with before Sejip? Um I don't remember her name. Okay. He's, he, her first name is Isabel. But. Okay, Isabel. Uh, so it doesn't matter. I'm just... Uh, uh, so she never corrected your posture. She just let you go like that. Yeah, no, because I was I was practicing like 15 minutes a week. So yeah. she just wanted to keep me interested. In, exactly. You know, okay. So I didn't care. And so... And the, the setup that you had was whatever. You don't even remember. Is that it? Or... Did you have a shoulder rest? Uh, yeah, I had a sponge. A sponge. Okay. Yeah, and then and then when I got into CJEP, I got a shoulder rest. A wolf. Okay. So you started with a sponge. Yeah. And then you were you were crooked with that. Yeah. With the sponge. Okay. <laughs> and I have a really long neck, so. Well, no, uh, maybe. Was like this. We're not gonna blame the sponge. 
but uh, I'm blaming the sponge. <laughs> okay, you blame the sponge. <laughs> Basically, you came into Seishim crooked, and uh, Zoe said, "That's too crooked. Uh, let's put a shoulder rest on you." Did yeah. she did she suggest the shoulder rest? Yeah. Okay, so you got the wolf, and then you straightened up. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, it was really like a. It really helped me a lot at okay. first. But so, then I started getting pains and. So. Okay, so up until Sejab, you didn't have any pains. Of course, you weren't practicing very much. Is that it? Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's it's hard pretty to... much the reason why. And then so you get into Sejab, you get into Sejab, and suddenly you have to practice more, right? Yeah, yeah. And like... so maybe you were crooked, and if you would have played more, uh, you would have uh, had pains before Sejab, yeah. but you weren't. So you get to Sejab, you end up playing more, and you change your to a shoulder rest. So we're not sure at this point whether it was the changing to the shoulder rest, the, the, the something, the equipment, or the fact that you're just playing more. Okay. But playing more doesn't mean you're going to get hurt. Okay. doesn't mean you're going to get pain. Doing something wrong more is going to get you into trouble. Okay. So that's what we have to find out. What is it that actually caused the pain? Well, what happened first is, uh, actually, I didn't have a lot of pain in the first years of CJET, but uh, I, had, I spent the summer busking all, all, all summer, you know, every day, like, hours before Sejip or after no in the Dur middle of it, in the middle okay time. and then I really had like a you know like the pain in the forearm with like buzzing thing left hand uh, left yeah. arm left arm yeah pain like, uh, uh, nerve yeah like nerve uh, buzzing stuff. okay bu bus bu it. busking busking outside uh, with microphone or with no microphone with no microphone no microphone okay yeah, in the street. so uh but that's so like a tingling, tingling. That's what we say in, in English. Yeah. Tingling nerves. Yeah. So when you have a tingling, and like in the finger and yeah, okay, end of the fingers, nerves. Okay, that's that's. So I went to see a physio uh, therapist. Okay, James too. Hang on, James too. Well, also when I went in, when I went to see the physio therapist. Yeah. He um, told me that uh, actually the problem in my arm came from my neck. Mm -hmm. Too much tension in the back of the neck. So I figured out. Well, I mean, I kind of figured out that. It was because I was, uh, you know, um, you know, like this all the time and pressing really hard. Mm -hmm. So, tried not to do it, but it's difficult. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, but it, it got better. Oh yeah. The pain. Yeah. Did Did you change anything, or you just no thought? Well, I I think about not putting as much pressure okay. on the pain. So the uh, it got better because of that, and also like the physiotherapist did some like massage. Stuff. Okay, physio, like, a bit of. Yeah. Did you do a lot of physio or just a bit? No, just like a few sessions, three sessions. Okay, like physio. That. And also, I stopped busking uh, four hours a day. Okay. <laughs> and so, yeah, went okay. back to see Jeff where I was practicing a bit less. All right, so here we go. So the summer was a bit of a bust because you were busking so much, and you had the nerve, and you went to physio a couple of times, and he told you, "Don't press so much." Uh, and so you did that and then stopped busking yep. and then you didn't hurt as much. Yep. Okay. So I guess when you don't play the violin, nothing hurts. Yeah. That's <laughs> crazy. That's a, it's amazing revelation here. Yeah. So, I mean, he could have been right. More than likely, uh, the nerves from the neck, because that's where they all come from. Mm -hmm. But also possible in the shoulder area, there's this... Uh, uh, thoracic outlet you got the thorax and then you got coming out of your arms you have nerves and arteries and everything and sometimes if you cut this off you know you'll lose the sensation in your arm okay and that's uh, not just violin it's, it's called thoracic outlet syndrome people can't uh, can't lift their arms yeah. uh, higher than this or something like that and they get tingling and stuff like that hmm. happens with people who do weightlifting too you know they get such muscles tight muscles it just oh, yeah. closes off, yeah. So it's it's, it's yeah. interesting, but I've had a couple of clients that had from a shoulder rest, you know, cutting oh, yeah, off the circulation. Really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. the shoulder rest is in such a position that it cuts the circulation and nerves, and then it doesn't work. Uh, can I just say something? I also noticed that when he puts on the shoulder rest, even with the shoulder rest, he raises his shoulder sometimes. Oh uh, yeah, that's a reflex I took to uh, quite a lot. Put uh, my uh, volume higher. <laughs> you know. Uh, sometimes people say, uh, you know, I got to raise the shoulder uh, to fill up the gap or something. It's not high enough. But it, I think the reason why people actually raise the shoulder is to hold the instrument. Because mm -hmm. if you don't raise the shoulder, it's going to fall off. You see, because what happens is uh, you put the violin there. And if you're using your shoulder for support, it's not enough to just put it there. Because if you put the violin there and then 
take your hand away, it's going to fall. So you have to have something pressing the violin onto the shoulder, you see. And so you basically do it with your head. Uh, but as soon as you do this, you have to press the other way because it's like a sandwich, right? Mm. You're holding something. So it's not, you can't just hold it with one hand. You have to hold it two. Two hands do the business, right? So, yeah, you press. I mean, some people can just keep their shoulder there and the violin there and boom. But uh, then your head goes that way. So if you don't want to put your head there, you keep your head there. You have to raise your shoulder so that your sandwich, you know, your bread, bread, and the bologna, right? Is the violin, right? Cheese is in the middle. Yeah, it's so like a really good sandwich. Yeah, I'm getting hungry. Uh, so basically, your shoulder is the bread and your head is the bread. So it's either way, yeah. it's a sandwich. Okay, so raising the shoulder, it happens whenever you want to secure the instrument, you know, whether you have a lot of room or not. People who have a short neck, you know, they raise their shoulder too to, to make the contact, except for those people that don't. And the people that don't raise their shoulder are the ones who don't use their shoulder. You know, you'll read in the old books like Spivakovsky and people like that say, the violin goes on the collarbone and that's it. And you use your head to hold it in, you know, and you never touch the shoulder. And those people never raise their shoulder for the purpose of, uh, of holding the instrument. Their shoulder does get raised, which you can demonstrate by shifting in position. is a natural way to go. Um, but we'll get to that. So... Back to the history. So uh, the nerves, da, 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 da. so that was that the only only pain problem thing that you had was just tingling in the left hand and. Uh, no, well, I had some other pains, always in the left hand and sh like back of the, you know. Uh, back of the shoulder. Okay. Yeah, yeah, back left of the shoulder, left shoulder. Like okay. recently, actually, I had back of the sh because ever since I started the uh, changing stuff again, uh -huh. like uh, this year. Okay. Uh, yeah, I had like some pain there, but now it's gone for some reason. I don't know why okay. exactly. Um, I was actually thinking of going to see the physio like uh, three weeks ago, but it just left. Okay. So. Yeah. I noticed you playing with this uh, Bond music uh, now. Yep. When I did you When did you switch When did you switch to that? I switched it. I, I assume that you just before this you had the wolf still, or, or was there more yeah, yeah, in between the wolf? I had nothing in between. Okay. Uh, the bomb music, I, I don't remember exactly if it was before my summer of busking or after. Um, I remember you had the bomb music uh, for a while when I was playing with you. So that was... Yeah, because uh, I remember asking you about it, I don't know, just a few years ago. But you did not have those cushions, if you can just show... Oh yeah, the cushions, the cushions. are uh, That's two months old. Recent. Yeah. Three months old. So, and I can find my just share, fill in some of the history. So he did not have those, that green cushion sponge. And he had a very low shoulder, uh, sorry, um, chin rest, the one that came with the violin, basically. Right. And then a while, and then he started university, and his teacher told him to put more of those green cushions. He had like three of them, I think. Three? Yeah, actually, three there those. was no green cushions before. Yeah, there was none. There were none. There were none. Yeah. So and that's he when he was raising his shoulders yeah. a lot. Then he started university with a low uh, chin rest, and then the teacher had him put three green cushions. And then I told him, let, let me give you a tall chin rest, and you can remove a few of the cushions. And this is where we are now. Okay. Yeah, because uh, actually my teacher, both my teacher and Dennis wanted me to like, instead of having my violin like this, try to have it more like this, you know? Mm -hmm. it makes a bit, well, makes I was just saying, yeah, he was. I just saw that he was raising his shoulder a lot. That's the only thing I saw. Okay. Where'd you get these cushions? Uh, they're actually uh, some like bathroom mats that yeah. my teacher brought to school with him. And okay. started like, you know, cutting them. And yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just want to know. Who else is chopping stuff up out there? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, uh, and uh, da, 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 okay. Let me. And when did you get? When did you give him this tall chin rest? That was probably around the end of summer. Oh no no no! Ab no. After after university yeah, started. It was like October. Yeah. Okay. Possibly October. Probably September, October. And actually, the, I found that really uh, more comfortable. It was just the tallest one I had in my school. You had it? You got it online? Yeah, I bought a bunch of chin reds just to see you. Okay. Interesting. Like, the grip is not, like, super good, but... No. But the height is nice. I've never seen this actually. 
they have a bit of popularity. I was reading some reviews and people like them. I mean, everyone's different, right? Everyone. If it works for some people. Great. You know, it's. Uh... Yeah, it's. I find it limiting. It it it's almost, it's almost, uh, it's almost there. It's like some ideas are okay, but they they didn't fall through. You know, so for me, it doesn't work. It doesn't mean it's not going to work for somebody else, but uh, I, I would rarely something like this would not work for most people. I could usually give them something more comfortable right away, for several reasons, which we can go into later, and we'll see.